So I would like to talk a bit about my main research interest at the moment. And in fact, this started all when I was a postdoc from 2017 to 19 at UCL, where I still continue now on a smaller scale. Um, so the, the motivation is to use sound and light for tomographic imaging. And the question is, as for me as a mathematician, how can we improve the imaging modality? So let's talk a bit shortly about tomographic imaging, or as we mathematicians like to call it, an inverse problem. So here we see one of the most classic uh, tomographic modalities. We have an X-ray source and we have a detector on the bottom. And what we actually what we want to measure is the photon, so the photon attenuation while they travel through the body. So this is our classic CT computerized tomography setup. So here on the right, we see what we actually get as measurements. So we see on the bottom, so on the horizontal axis, we have the angle while the source rotates around the patient. And then on the, the vertical axis, we have the measurements that we get for each of these angles. So this is what we call the forward problem. So that's the measurement process where we get our data. And then the inverse problem is to reconstruct these slices. That's where the word tomography comes from. So we want to see inside the body from these outside measurements. So that's the classic CT setup. Um, unfortunately, x-rays are harmful if you use them too often on your patients, as we, most of you probably know. Um, so there are different modalities nowadays using magnetism in magnetic resonance imaging. But what we are looking into is the possibility to, uh, to use light and coupled sound imaging, uh, especially on a smaller scale. So we want to measure only on a small scale. So how can we do that? This goes back to the so-called photoacoustic effect, which has been already discovered by Alexander Graham Bell in 1880 while he was trying to build his telephone. But first, he actually experimented with what he called the photophone. So he tried to, to transport sound or to transport uh, messages by emitting light. And he noticed that if this light is absorbed by a solid body like metal, the, the metal expands and you can convert this into a sound wave. So here we actually see the light is collected by this huge uh, apparatus and turned into a sound wave that the listener can hear. Um, unfortunately, this didn't really work out very well to use for the telephone because you can't really use this, or at least back in the days, to get really speech out of it. But essentially, this was the first wireless phone, but you only get one sound out of it. Good, how can we use this for imaging? We can use it very similarly. We, we illuminate our target, which is now a biological tissue, with uh, light and we create a sound, in fact, an ultrasound wave, which we can measure with classic ultrasound detectors. So let's look how this works in practice. So here we have a target that we would like to measure. So imagine that you, you, you don't see the target, but we, have, we just want to interrogate from the outside. We want to interrogate this from the outside and measure some, something from the boundary. So what do you take? We take a laser, similar action, not quite similar to this, a bit more high-powered version, but we illuminate now the target with a very short laser pulse, and the light is absorbed by the target, so which first heats up the tissue and leads to a local pressure increase in the tissue. So here we see the absorption, as you very clearly see, where the light hits the target. Of course, we have more of the energy absorbed, and in the back, we have a bit less of the energy absorbed. So this leads now to our sound problem, so we have the sound propagation. So now we have here in the middle, we have the initial pressure that now propagates through the medium, and we want to measure it now on a circle that surrounds the target. So now the pressure waves distribute through the target, and we can collect them here on the boundary that surround the target. And then when we wait long enough to get our measurements, of course in practice it's a lot faster, then we get this measurement. So here we have again, we have our measurements on the time axis and we have the angle that surrounds our target. 
So this is now our forward problem again. So from light propagation, we create an, an ultrasound signal and then we, we measure the ultrasound around the target. How do we get now an image back? In fact, in this case, it's rather simple. We can just revert computationally this process. We just revert it in time. So what we do, we, because we know the equations, we can simulate that backwards in time. And we just back propagate basically the energy back into the target and we get our image back in a short moment. So it's very nice. Unfortunately, in practice, as you might imagine, it doesn't always work so nicely. And in particular, the problem is in practice, of course, we can't surround our target with a full circle or in 3D with a whole sphere. So that's a problem. And in particular, in the lab at UCL, it looks like this. So now we have our target here lying on the sensor and we have a planar sensor that is underneath the target. So just to to remind you, the measurement process was we excite the target now with a short laser pulse, the, the light gets absorbed, which uh, heats up the tissue and we get the pressure wave that we can collect uh, with our sensor. And here in this case, so we have now an in interferometer, which means so we have two plates with a specific uh, distance to each other and when the pressure wave hits the sensor, the distance changes. And we can read that out now with a second interrogation laser. So the measurement process is basically we illuminate the target, we get our signal and we read it out at one point. And now we need to do that again for each of the points on the sensor, which turns out to be pretty slow <laughs> if we want to do that very accurately and get a lot of data. And on top of that, also the reconstruction, unfortunately, because we need to simulate now the, these, these equations carefully. It's also pretty slow. So it's a rather slow modality, especially if you want to do something that's moving. So here in this case, of course, the mouse needs to be sedated. But in fact, if you're very patient, you get amazing images out of this. So this is in fact, this is a mouse liver. So I think that you're looking from, now from the sensor, you're looking through the skin of the mouse and you see here on the right, so this, this so-called maximum intensity projection from the top and we have the side views. So this is where also the energy gets absorbed in the liver and the blood vessels. So this is where, where we absorb the, the light. Good, so how do we get such nice images? So mathematically, the reconstruction process works like this. So we have here, we have our measurements now given. We have, this is our, again, our ultrasound signal. We get our first initial reconstruction. We get, so, so basically it's a first guess. And what we do then is we now simulate again our equations. So we have in the reconstruction, we simulate in our computer how good it is and compare that to the measurements. So we compare how good is our reconstruction and that uh, tells us then how do we need to, need to improve our reconstructions. So basically in mathematical terms, uh, so-called is the gradient of the data fidelity term, if you're familiar with these terms. So that tells us how do we need to improve our image, but how do we combine them? So now we have some uh, update rules that tells us in which, how, how we combine these two to get a better image. And then we can repeat this over and over again. So now we have a new reconstruction, we get a new update, and then we can repeat this until we are satisfied and we get a nice <coughs> reconstruction here on the right. Also already, just to let you know what this is, it's, an, it's just a phantom, so it's a, a numerical phantom of a tumor with uh, the vessels around it. So that's what we're interested also to image. So, works nice, we get really nice images, but as, we are, as I said, it's also pretty slow. So the problem, the limitation here is, it takes a long time of these repetitions, we need to simulate, our, our measurements all over again and reconstruct and compare it, is it good enough, and keep repeating this process. So it can take a long time to get good reconstructions out of this. And on top of this, what we call, it's an ill post inverse problem. So that means we actually need some more knowledge to get good reconstruction. So we need to tell this algorithm what is good and what we actually expect to see to get something good out of it. So, Sounds very difficult to do this, and especially if you need to model this mathematically. 
And in the last years, as we know, there's been an explosion in using data for, in various ways. And one way to do this in our way, now we have a lot of measurements from our lab. Can we now use, the question is, can we now use actually data to improve this process in a clever way? So actually, I do like these images quite a lot. Uh, here you see two fingers next to each other. So here you see the gap between the fingers. Uh, and these are the, the vascularity in one of the, one of the fingers. And so these are typically, these are all taken from, from, I think, the palm. This is a bit of a larger vessel, so I think it's here taken from, from the wrist area. So these are all taken from volunteers in our lab. <laughs> you put the hand on the scanner and then just wait. Good. So the question is, how do we use this now? We have now our data, we have our examples. What can we do with this? So simple speaking, um, we have now our data given here. And what we do is, well, we train a neural network by this, uh, with this sample data. And what is this neural network supposed to do? It's not just supposed to give us an image from our measurements. That wouldn't be a very clever way to do it, even though you can do it. What we do is, in our case, is we now replace our mathematical updating rules. We replace it with a learned updating rule. So now we teach a neural network by using sample data how to perform a better update and how to include this prior knowledge that we need to know to get nice images from some training data. Then on top, we can also, we can also constrain it to say, well, we want to do this more efficiently. We don't want to wait for hundreds of times in repeating this process. Let's say we only want to do this five times. And we want to have a good result after five times. So we, we only repeat this now for a fixed amount of times and to get our nice reconstructions at the end. And it works amazingly well in practice. So here we have an example. Here on the left, we have, our, again, so these are measurements from a human uh, taken from the wrist. Uh, no, not the wrist, the palm here, I think. Um, so this is the conventional reconstruction. It takes about 10 minutes to get this image. It's a, it's a pretty nice image, maybe. There's a bit of the, well, there's a few blocky artifacts in there. Um, but on the right, we use this learned reconstruction approach, which helps us to speed up the whole thing by a factor of 32, so down to 20 seconds. And that's, that's quite an achievement. And it's maybe a bit, it's not as sharp, but we get a few more details, uh, especially our experimentalists, they're very happy with this. So that's nice, <clears throat> but what do we do with this now? So now we have these images, how do they help us clinically? So we're not done actually quite yet in our process. Um, so uh, what we actually want to do with photoacoustics, so only what we did here is we reconstructed now the so-called acoustic problem. What I didn't touch up on is now actually reconstructing the optical problem. So now we get our, we get our nice images here but to now tackle to actually use the information that we have from the light, what we, what we do is we don't just get one reconstruction. Now we want to get actually multiple reconstructions with different wavelengths. So now we see a cross section here. So we have a cross section for the reconstruction on different wavelengths. And we, we want what we want to get from there is now the actual absorption, how much energy is absorbed in each of these points. And if we have now multiple wavelengths, we know the absorptions, what we can do basically, so by so-called spectral unmixing, what we can get, we cannot get blood oxygenation out of this. And that would tell us actually a lot about tumor growth and tumor developments, how, ves how vessels, how how much oxygen is in the vessels and how, how, how they accumulate around the tumor. So this would be the holy grail of photoacoustic imaging, solving this problem to get accurate blood oxygenation estimates in a picture. And that's what the title refers to, the accurate imaging of sound and light. We only have the sound so far accurate. We don't have the light accurate yet. So, and well, that would be what we actually want to achieve. Unfortunately, so far, this only works in practice. Uh, no, sorry, this only works in simulations. <laughs> Not yet in practice. 
that's the problem. Um, so that's basically what we're going to spend our next years probably on, trying to get from our measurements, not only get a nice photoacoustic image, but also get the blood oxygenation estimates out of there that we can then actually use for cancer screening, monitoring on a small scale, and hopefully also for uh, drug development. Thank you.